my apologies for that everyone um i think there has been load shedding so the generator was just kicking in but as i was saying good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to episode three of the golden key online conference titled thriving in a pandemic if you are joining us for the first time thank you so much for tuning in you have made an excellent decision and if you are back welcome mm -hmm. back again my name is alma akob and i'm going to be your host for this conference so First of all, just some quick ground rules. Please make sure that you are muted at all times. Make sure that your video is off as well so that we can give a speaker our full attention and all the respect that she deserves. Also, if you are not a Golden Key member, just some information. Golden Key is an international honor society that recognizes the top 15% academically excellent students in over 400 universities worldwide. Now, Without further ado, before I introduce the speaker, please make sure to use the chat option for all your questions, for all your key points, and make sure you use it throughout the duration of the talk and not just at the end so that I can keep track of all your questions and make sure that they are asked and answered. A great pleasure to announce and to welcome our first speaker, Yogaveli Nambia, who joined Alan Gray Orbis Foundation in October 2017 as the Chief Executive Officer. Previously, she was the founding director of the Enterprise Development Academy at Gordon Institute of Business Science, where she led the school's entrepreneurial efforts. She started the academy in 2014 to offer scholarship-based opportunities and education and support for entrepreneurs to start up micro and small enterprises who were previously marginalized or underserved, and this led to it being commended by cabinet. Prior to that, she was the country director of Goldman Sachs, 10,000 Women Initiative, which is a leading, which leads the design and delivery of the successful international women's entrepreneurship program in South Africa. Now, in addition to this, she is a founding director of the Enterprise Development Council of South Africa, which was set up to standardize and professionalize the sector, a board member of Reed Educational Trust, and sits on a ministerial task team to develop national SMME development master plans. And as if that's not enough, she also lectures on the social entrepreneurship program, teaching different business models that can be used to create social change. Her CV goes on for pages and pages, and I really wish that I could say it all to you, but mm -hmm. let us go straight into what she'll be talking about today. Please help me welcome Yoga Veli, who will be talking about um, a talk titled Professional and Thought Leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can give her virtual claps, you can send mm -hmm. things in the chats, and let's just welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Alma, for that very kind introduction. Um, I just want to confirm that everyone can hear me okay? Yeah? I can't um, see the chat while I look at my notes, but um, if you just see my mouth moving and you're not hearing anything, please let me know. We can hear you. Uh, can hear you. <laughs> okay, good, good. So good evening, everyone. I'm really honored to have been invited to address you all today and to be among such bright, talented, high potential young people. Um, it always gives me a thrill to be chatting to to young people, or, or should I say younger people, uh, and, and always just being excited by the dynamic energy of that. I know now we are doing this virtually, and it's, it's um, very strange, this new way of doing things. I think, you know, um, it, it's something we all have to get used to, but, um, but I, I hope to feel the virtual energy in the room. Um, when I realized the topic of leading in a pandemic uh, that I needed to speak on, I was a bit concerned because when the audience is invited to listen to someone, they assume that that speaker is an expert in the topic. And I'm certainly no expert. So I'm putting a disclaimer out there that I'm fig figuring all of this out um, and learning alongside you. So some of what I say might work for me, may not work for you, et cetera. Um, but to give you a quick sense of who I am, thank you for the introduction. Um, maybe just a, a level of, of who I am and, and, and what um, some of that experience links into. So I'm from a lower middle class family from the township of Chatsworth in Durban. I had a very sheltered upbringing. 
And after university, I started off in a corporate communications career initially at Sun International and then in Vodacom. Um, and I later left to India to do some human rights work. I initially thought that it was going, you know, it was going to be a year. Um, I ended up staying for eight years working with women who'd been trafficked into prostitution. And, um, uh, and this involved rescuing women from sort of high risk and dangerous situations and bringing them back, um, you know, across borders back into the country, that being India. Um, and, and then working on mainstreaming them, um, you know, helping them get access to the economy, et cetera. And that's how I discovered entrepreneurship. I also coordinated and ran a conference called the World Court of Women Against War for Peace. And we, um, we sort of defined war as any human rights violation committed against a woman. So it wasn't war like with army tanks and all of that but that there is actually a war against women. And remember this was, um, I'm, I'm uh, afraid to tell you, you're going to calculate my age, but um, this was 20 years ago that I left for, um, uh, for India and, and worked on, on, on all of this. And basically in that conference, we brought together women from uh, different regions, mostly sort of, you know, uh, developing countries to speak about the human rights violations they'd experienced. Um, I also ran an organization for people with disabilities from mild to severe and profound retardation. I advocated on both causes across India and Asia, and I've worked with other NGOs drafting UN legislation to support women who'd been trafficked uh, or who were refugees and migrants. So, so um, I came back, I, I looked to merge social change and entrepreneurship and, and um, you know, was in the early days of social entrepreneurship really being spoken about as, as um, something that was viable to do. So through consulting work, through teaching and through running my own social enterprise, I, um, I, I was uh, happily able to merge my uh, purpose, which was to create the social change through entrepreneurship, which is, is where the sort of astute business mind side of me um, found joy as well. I also started and, and ran a luxury travel business, um, which did pretty well. Um, and then I created, through various meanderings, um, a sponsorship-driven academy for entrepreneurship education at Gibbs, which is the Gordon Institute of Business Science, the business school of the University of Pretoria. Um, and by the time I left in, in October 2017, um, that academy had seen more than 2,000 entrepreneurs who didn't have the requisite education or funds to study at a business school actually receive entrepreneurship education there of the, of the highest quality. So now at the Alan Gray Obers Foundation, we work on identifying and nurturing uh, entrepreneurial potential in high achieving young people at school and university. Katie is, is one of them. And, um, and so um, this kind of brings to bear for me a few areas that I'm really interested in. One um, is creating social change. As I said, that's, that's my purpose. That's what India helped me to, to discover. Entrepreneurship, which which excites me around, um, you know, how opportunity uh, driven it is and how it's a completely different way of viewing the world as, um, as well as working with young people where you can really sort of nurture potential and, and, and sort of build this future that you're looking at. So I'm telling you all of this um, to understand that I may be identified as a leader in my role as CEO of the foundation, but who I am as a leader is a culmination of all the years that went before and all those experiences. And, and one can't quite condense 27 years of working and 20 years in, in human rights and social change, um, you know, in, into, into sort of a short crisis, but, but uh, that's, that was my attempt. So this, this time that we're living in fills the description of a VUCA world, right? All this, um, there was like this talk about VUCA this, VUCA that, and, and suddenly it hit us with the pandemic. It was volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it's all the things we've been talking about preparing for, and yet it slapped us in the face when it came along. And I'm not even sure that we could have been completely prepared for what's happening in the world right now. 
And it's certainly not easy to be the person that has to sift through all of that and provide direction to others. Um, it's possible, of course, many of us do it, but it's not easy. So why exactly is leadership important in a time like this? Um, and it's always good to pause because sometimes it, it seems like such an obvious thing, but I think it's important to really interrogate that and understand that actually, especially in times like this, it's the, it's the best time to be a leader. There are like numerous examples of people who've stepped up in times like, like this, and people need inspiration and motivation um, at a time like this. So uh, the entities and groups that we lead um, need stability in this kind of time of uncertainty. Um, we need to provide direction, vision, guidance, when people feel rudderless, when um, you know, we talk about uncertainty, we talk about volatility, people, um, you know, it, it's too much to adapt to at one, at one stage. So people need someone who is going to provide that direction for them, still nurture, collaborate, support them, but provide vision, provide direction, and, and give them hope. Um, and, and it enables people to find ways of pivoting. So when you give people hope and, and you help them to see what lies beyond that immediate danger, that immediate risk, the immediate um, uncertainties, then they're able to find hope in a new reality. And, and that's what a leader has to do. Not the, the version of a, a leader that's just like in front and with the title and people are kind of, you know, sort of subservient to you because, um, well, that's just uh, um, ridiculous, a ridiculous um, sort of image to even try and uphold at, at a time like this where everyone's floundering. So leaders help to harness value, basically, for communities, for the country, for uh, the individuals that they work with. So today I thought I'd provide three overarching thoughts. I mean, there are many, but since we have um, a limited time, three overarching thoughts or guiding principles on how we can be more of that person, more of that leader, how we can delve deeper into ourselves and offer a meaningful contribution at this time. So I tried to kind of distill it into these three. And as I said, you may or may not agree with me. Um, these were the things that I thought um, have helped me during this time as a leader. So the first thing is know yourself. Sounds very simple, very obvious, but um, I, I don't know how many of us can say with hand on heart that we truly know ourselves, know our values, et cetera. The second thing is to embrace the world with curiosity, with empathy, and with an entrepreneurial lens. And the third thing is to be bold, be brave, and take action. So I'm going to cover those three um, quickly so that I can hopefully try and provide some, some background and some foundation to the questions that you may want to ask. So on the first, um, on, on the first thing, which is about knowing yourself, to be a leader of others, you first have to be a leader of yourself. To master yourself, you need to know yourself and to know yourself you need to ask questions of yourself. So if you think about anyone you meet and um, when you want to get to know them, you ask them questions. And how many of us actually ask ourselves questions? Really interesting, in-depth um, questions that help interrogate the various layers of who we are. Uh, and we think we just know that, but until it's really asked as a question, our mind doesn't rise up to try and answer it. It just may lie dormant there. So, you know, there's, um, there's a quote, let me not butcher it, but if you ask um, your mind if, it will just say yes or no. If you ask your, your mind why or how, it will rise up to try and answer it. So, so it's, you know, if, if I had just asked myself, uh, am I a good person? It's a yes or no kind of answer. But um, if I asked myself, how are you a good person? How do you actually manifest that in the world? The brain works differently to try and answer that. But if we are to question ourselves, we need to have an open mind to receive the answers and we need to be honest with ourselves. And that is really important to always remain on purpose and to be authentic. 
So some of the questions, and if we relate this to thought leadership, some of the questions we should be asking ourselves is, why would we even want to be a thought leader? Why is it important to us? Why is it important to the world? Do we understand our purpose, our why? Um, what unique offering do we have to make in the world? Do, do we know what we want to influence or lead? We may want our voices heard, but how are we actually improving on the silence? So there's, there's that um, uh, you know, quote as well. And like when you're, when you're having a conversation, you should only speak if you're improving upon the silence. So we may want our voices heard, but how are we improving on the silence? How can we orientate our unique thoughts, skills, expertise, knowledge, all of these things to what's happening currently in the world right now? How can we use it, mold it, and offer it to others in a way that creates value for somebody else? So, uh, so not just saying this is all that I know and downloading it um, onto someone, but how, how can I download it in a way that makes sense for you, that offers value to you? So especially at this time, to find clarity and coherence, you have to listen to yourself closely. And you can only do that, I believe, when all the other sounds and the voices around you are quiet. And, and the way that I do it is through meditation. Um, I find that quite helpful to kind of center myself, to understand that I am not my thoughts. Um, I am the, the, I'm beyond the consciousness. Um, so I don't want to get too airy-fairy and too esoteric, but, but um, uh, it's a separation of, of who I am uh, as, as the soul and, and what I put out in the world and what I think. And I have the ability to change those thoughts. So um, Simon Sinek, uh, who many of you would know by now, internationally acclaimed TED Talker and author, spoke about this premise, right? Start with the why. It's what the Japanese refer to as ikigai, the reason for being. And um, some of you may, may know this. I've also spoken about it often. It's when your mission and your passion aligns with your profession or you know, whatever your vocation is. It's what speaks to you about the world and the impact you want to make in it. So Simon refers to a story in his book, very old story, but I really liked it. And I, I want to quickly share it with you. So at the end of the 19th century, the race was on to invent or develop the first machine powered, controlled and manned flight. Samuel Langley was a front runner. He was well known. He had the expertise, the resources, government networks. He had funding support and he had teams of highly knowledgeable people to help him. A few hundred kilometers away, two brothers, you've got it, Orville and Wilbur Wright, who are working with the same goal but with none of the above resources. They didn't have a large funder, they had no networks, and in fact, no one in their team even had a college education. All that they did have was that they knew why they were doing it. They didn't just care about being first. They knew that a manned flight could transport people to faraway places, that mobility would bring exploration and progress and adventure. They shared that passion with everyone. They worked on it night and day, and they were able to get people to support them with whatever they needed. So I don't need to tell you, obviously, who ended up creating that first man flight. The brothers had what Langley lacked, purpose. The point is this, you could be brilliant. You could be a front runner receiving lots of support, and you could have the world at your feet. But if you don't know your why, what drives you, what keeps you focused and resilient when times are tough, then like Langley with all those abundant resources, the race will be lost to others who are hungrier, who are more passionate and who are better able to create a vision to dedicate themselves to. So relating this to thought leadership, remember it's not just about having knowledge. Everyone has some knowledge of something. This is about creating insight and value through using that knowledge and influencing someone or something positively. So knowledge only means something when it is shared. Otherwise, you're just sitting with a whole lot of stuff in your head that um, makes you maybe feel self-important, but, but doesn't actually create value in, in, the, in the world. 
So Gillan Gork, who is a, a South African mentalist, says that where leadership, which is about influencing others, self-mastery, um, where you influence yourself, and purpose, which is in, about influencing a cause, intersect, where those three things intersect, that's where you lead a limitless life. So I just want to repeat that because I, I really um, like that. It's where leadership about influencing others, self-mastery, where you influence yourself, and purpose, where you influence a cause, where those three things intersect, that's where you lead a limitless life. So, so that's about knowing yourself. The second um, step or principle that I spoke about is about embracing the world with empathy, curiosity, and an entrepreneurial lens. So what does this mean and, and why is it important? I want to illustrate this using the teaching of both a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Um, um, view on a considered, I may know him from his work in positive psychology. So it's easy in the midst of everything happening in our country right now. And sure, it is a lot. Like it's relentless. 2020, I mean, most, most times we have a laugh that it needs to be canceled. But it's, it's easy to, to understand that in the midst of everything happening in the country, in the world, to feel this huge sense of helplessness and hopelessness. You know, there's corruption, there's gender-based violence, there's the pandemic, there's racism, there's poverty, there's unemployment, it's a lot. Um, it's completely understandable that we're likely to get sucked into it and feel helpless about it. So I want to illustrate what learned helplessness is by using the story of an elephant. Um, when I was living in India, I went to this elephant rescue camp um, and I saw this massive bull elephant that to my shock was restrained by just a small chain uh, to a tree. So I asked the, the mahout, which is his handler, why would a wild elephant of this massive size be restrained by such a, a small, weak looking chain? And his response was that the elephant had learned from the time it was young and obviously much smaller that the chain could hold him back. So he grew up thinking that he was still helpless against the chain. And it continued to hold him in place, even as a full grown, huge, powerful animal that could have easily broken it. I mean, isn't that crazy? How many such mental barriers are holding us in place, keeping us from exploring what more we can do? Because either someone told us something when we were young, or we tried something once and it didn't work. I mean, so many. Um, layers of barriers that we put upon ourselves. So how do we move away from such learned helplessness? So Viktor Frankl famously said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So the insight in this quote, I love this quote, the insight in this quote for me is that when I apply it to situations and I pause between the stimulus and the response and I apply empathy, the growth and freedom is for myself from you know, tying my response to the other person, but also to give me a broader understanding of the context of others around me. It provides me with an opportunity to know that which I cannot know just from my own frame of, of mind or my own perspective. When I pause in that, um, when I stop and pause between that stimulus and the response and I apply curiosity, the growth and the freedom is in me being able to explore that situation, to not be bound by any limits in thinking or doing. It widens the world for me. And, it, and, and my ability to understand it. So it becomes something I can play with, that I can be you know, curious, playful with, and, and, and explore in a way that um, doesn't limit me by my constraining thoughts or my unconscious biases. 
when I pause between the stimulus and the response and I apply an entrepreneurial lens, the growth and the freedom is from the world and the chaos and the change it brings because I now have freedom in how I respond. Irrespective of what the world throws at me, I have the perspective and the attitude to mine value from it because I'm entrepreneurial. And if you know anything about being entrepreneurial, you don't let things stop you easily. You don't, you don't get, um, uh, you may get blindsided by, uh, by a, um, a shocking event or, or situation, but, uh, but you quickly rally up and you try to find the opportunity within it. So there's a line in the book, The Prosperity Paradox by Clayton Christensen that goes, in the struggle lies opportunity. So it's so simple, but I just love it because it, you know, we expect opportunity to come around like all wrapped in a bow, looking lovely and beautifully presented. And we just have to like sort of stand around and it will present itself to us. Um, but actually it's in the struggle where opportunity lies. And the pandemic, for example, is a struggle. And it, it's a place in which we're uncomfortable. So automatically, one can, uh, can immediately um, understand from that, that there's going to be opportunity here. And I love that because it's about reframing adverse situations into opportunities to learn and add value. It reminds me of William Kamkwamba, I often speak about him because, again, just fascinated by his story. You might have heard of him as well. He was the inspiration of the book and the movie, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. So what was amazing about his story, and I'll just mention it. I'm not sure if I, I've, I've um, like any of you would have heard me speak about it. But, um, but what was amazing about his story is that as a boy living in a rural drought and famine-stricken village in Malawi, he was so poor that his family couldn't afford to send him to school. But he loved books and he broke into the school library to read. And that's where he found out about windmills. And he thought about um, how they could be used to pump water from the ground. He learned through that book how to build a windmill and um, successfully did so with various waste materials around the village. He was just a 14 year old boy possessed by an idea and found a way to make it a reality. And he went on to implement it in other villages which enabled thousands of people to get more reliable access to water for their crops. And he became an internationally acclaimed social entrepreneur. So we've got great local stories as well of finding opportunity in the midst of most difficult circumstances. Even in the midst of the pandemic, we've had two Ellen Gray Fellows step up to create rapid testing kits when they recognize the, the need. Incidentally, the foundation um, has conducted research with over a thousand entrepreneurs in South Africa on uh, the competencies, mindset competencies and attributes um, that they demonstrate. And we found that there were 14 that were the most common. Uh, they're available on our website if you'd like to have a look at, um, at, at what they are. Uh, but there were 14 that stood out as being vital to entrepreneurial thinking. And when we compared those competencies to the competencies that the World Economic Forum says are required for future-proofing young people, they're basically the same. So in other words, an entrepreneurial mindset made up of all these different competencies is what is needed for the future whether or not you become an entrepreneur, you um, require these competencies to deal with the disruptions and the changes um, and the chaos of the future, because the pandemic is surely not the last uh, chaos that we, that we face. So if you want to be a leader, a good leader, be empathetic, be curious, and entrepreneurial in your outlook. So thirdly, out of those three principles, take action. You've got to be bold. You've got to be brave. You've got to take that first step. So let's just take a step back and think about what it means to be a thought leader. So just to dissect that part from the, the title, um, what does it mean to be a thought leader? I want to talk it through using a very facetious example. So the way that I think about it um, is that you take an observation or an idea. 
So you observe something, or you take an idea. Um, for example, you observe that many people like tomato sauce, right? Then you have to uncover an original insight about that idea. So maybe what you discover is that tomato sauce makes people more entrepreneurial. Um, then you layer your special expertise on it. You design a program that brings tomato sauce to more young people, making them more entrepreneurial across the country and revitalizing the tomato farming sector. Then you give people evidence. So you're like, I have data that demonstrates that my program has resulted in 10,000 new entrepreneurs. That's when people are going to sit up and listen. Give people, finally, out of, of, out of those five, um, give people a compelling vision or action to take forward. I have specific ways in which you can apply, replicate, or scale what I know about making young people entrepreneurial in unique and innovative ways. So you can apply this using other types of sauces. Maybe you want to use mustard uh, or, or barbecue sauce or other vegetables. But I've now given you the foundation, the, the, almost the structure for your thinking. And that's how I'm a thought leader. I've taken an observational idea. I've uncovered an original insight about that idea. I've layered my special expertise on it. I've given people evidence of how it works. And then I've given people a compelling vision or action to take forward from it. So right from the start of this journey with tomato sauce, you needed to take action. You build your thought leadership chops by actually engaging with the observation you had right in the beginning. If you just stayed with that idea and you were thinking about it and you're so excited about your idea and feeling really um, happy with yourself and proud of yourself, but you didn't actually do anything about it, then basically that idea is just, is just an idea. It remains that. It remains worthless in the world except to, to kind of make you feel sort of proud of yourself, but it has an added um, value. So John Senai, a, a popular futures strategist and a human behavior specialist spoke at the beginning of the lockdown in South Africa of how, about how all his work um, is about speaking to people and about giving talks and stage, everything is done in person. And he was dependent on events and obviously the whole events industry just crashed. So suddenly the pandemic and that, and the result in lockdown changed all of that. And he had to completely like upend his business model and how he offered his services. He chose to collaborate. He didn't sell, he added value. He concentrated on adding value and he really encouraged um, thought leadership. So through that, he's back on track. He's, he's gotten himself either Either, you know, post lockdown, he may choose to, uh, to go back to doing things as they were. Likely, he would choose a hybrid because now he's discovered a whole new streams of how to, to do things. Another example of taking action, and, and I, I humbly offer myself as an example because, um, because I didn't even discover that this was um, sort of me really taking bold action until many years later, but 20 years ago, as I mentioned to you, I went to India for the first time on a holiday. I saw this massive discrepancy between the rich and the poor, huge levels of poverty and inequality. So I came back home. I resigned from a high paying job at Vodacom. I sold my house and car and I moved to India to change this dire situation in India. Um, and, and while I didn't achieve what I set out to do, my goal was a bit too lofty even uh, for my then idealistic brain being in my sort of uh, in my 20s. What turned out to be an eight-year experience in human rights and social change in India completely changed my life. It even resulted in a chapter in a book being written about me and my journey in human rights. I found my purpose through that journey and the entire path of my life pivoted and my insight into the world has totally shifted because of that experience, none of which would have happened had I not taken the step to leave my comfort zone. So if the fear of failure had paralyzed either me or any of the people I've mentioned, like William in Malawi and many others, 
they would have stayed where they are. They would have tried to make ends meet, not taking any chances, any risks, not striving for more, and just giving up when it got difficult. So when the fear of taking on a challenge strikes you, of actually taking that step, think of the words of Tata Nelson Mandela, who said, there is no passion to be found playing small. In settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. So to conclude, I'd like to just recap those three principles. Know yourself. Um, so to know yourself, ask yourself deep um, and, and meaningful questions. Embrace the world with curiosity, empathy, and an entrepreneurial lens. And be bold, be brave, and take action. There are many more barriers to be broken, many more life-changing strides to be made, and you are the ones to do it. Choose your path without fear and smash all the preconceptions that surround you. Remember, as the famous quote goes, it always seems impossible until it's done. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Jogo Veli, for this motivation and this new fire that you've ignited in all of us. Like Nkateko was saying, there's so many tweetable moments from this talk that we'll all have to rush back to YouTube after it's been posted, just to make sure we can get all of those moments where you said such inspiring things. So thank you so, so much. You mentioned at the beginning of the talk that knowledge only means something when it is shared. And I think that is so... Um, it's, it's a fundamental concept because knowledge is power. And yes. so if you're not sharing knowledge, then that means you're not empowering anyone. So I thought that was an absolutely phenomenal presentation and thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. So heading straight into our questions, we've got a question from Kateko who wants to know that you mentioned that the leader you are today is a culmination of all your experiences in life. And your first point was about being yourself. So do you have any practical advice on overcoming some difficult experiences that one might have experienced? Mm. Yeah. Gosh, there's, there's so many. Um, if I think about like this, things are just like kind of flooding, flooding me now. I mean, right from um, when, sorry, did you want me to answer the question now? Or did you want to uh, take more questions? Um, I, 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 I can, yeah, I can wait for you to answer the question now and then I'll ask okay. another. If you're happy okay, with sure. that. Yeah. Um, so I, if I think about, um, you know, in the early days of me working, um, it was, I'm talking about 92, 93, 94. So those um, years of like just pre and during like uh, the start of democracy, lots of um, situations of racism uh, faced, you know, and um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, you know, I won't necessarily go into that in detail because I think we, you know, we would have, most of us would have um, suffered um, some incidences or the other. But um, I think for me, that's when this deep sense of a belief in myself started manifesting and, and a, a recognition that there, there's some level of insecurity in another person to need to inflict that. Um, you know, sort of these racist kind of um, acts and, and experiences. Um, so for me, I think very early on, a practical thing for me was putting um, practices in place that allowed me to let go of, of, of negative energy. Um, I mentioned meditation as one, although that did come a little bit later. I, I learned more about it when I was in uh, India. Um, and, and just the power of, of sort of working with your consciousness and being able to, uh, to segregate um, some of that negative energy that people bring into your world and being able to kind of push that out. Um, the other thing that I, I do is, um, so I'm, I'm, actually quite an introvert. Uh, I've, I've gone through a journey of being very extroverted when I was younger in my 20s and, and now I'm quite introverted. But I spend time in nature and I um, remind myself of my why. And I'll do that 
through different things, through different ways. Again, through asking myself questions. Um, I put up affirmations around, around me. And I have uh, people who uh, I trust who are not just accountability partners, but encouragement partners. Uh, people who, you know, they're not going to just say, Yogi, you did a good job. They're going to dissect that a little bit and say, remember your purpose was about this and you did one, two, and three, which created a big difference towards that. So people who know me well enough to be able to, um, to, to give me that narrative in a way that I'll find it believable, you know? So not just people who are going to like high five me and say, you know, job well done, but people who, who really help me link what I did and what I accomplished with where I said I wanted to be. Um, and um, I think one of the other things that as I've, um, so, so the early thing was racism. The, within the human rights work, um, within the human rights work was, it was very dangerous. It's not something I speak about often, but I've been in situations where I've, you know, um, had a gun at my, my head. I've had a terrorist group um, from Pakistan threaten me. I've had, um, you know, situations where um, basically I, w I wouldn't have been around anymore to, to even have this talk with, with you. Um, in rescuing the women from other countries, we had to go across borders where the, it was a war-torn area. We've had, um, uh, you know, uh, situations where the groups that had trafficked these women actually um, had um, sort of chased us down, th uh, threatened us. There were times that, um, you know, I was almost kidnapped by, by this group. It sounds like a movie, even when I say it now, I, I'm like, oh my God, the crazy things that I've done. And the thing is, the reason that I was able to, you know, manage during that time and, and, and get through it and be resilient was because I deeply, deeply believed in what I was doing. And there was no question um, that I was in the right place and I was doing important work. Look, um, not to make myself sound like a hero because initially when I went into that work, um, I didn't actually understand what I was agreeing to. It sounded a lot more adventurous in my head. And then when I actually was doing it, when you've got to, you know, you've got to do like terrible, make terrible choices, like having to leave one woman behind because the truck you were in could only take so many, um, you know, so many people. And as a 26 year old, 27 year old, to make that choice of who needs to come and who needs to stay behind is absolutely life changing. I will never be able to fully get over that. But what I used um, at that time was that time in nature, was meditation, was the practice of reminding myself why I was doing what I was doing. Um, and there are different things that work for different people. So I think um, maybe in terms of practices uh, that you hit upon something, I mean, I have friends who, who, who dance it out or sing it out, you know, who use the arts, who use creative arts in, in therapeutic ways. I've got a friend who rides horses and, and, and spends time with animals, you know, so it's, there's different practices that help you stay resilient. Um, I'll give you one last thing on, on that, um, just to shock you guys even more, is that in the midst of like all of that, um, or after all of that, I then started my business with my uh, best friend, um, at, at the time, um, the luxury travel business. Um, and I never, uh, you know, put together a partnership agreement. That best friend defrauded me, totally took that company away from me and uh, did a whole lot of things that, uh, you know, absolutely left me with nothing after that, that business. And I was able to pick myself up because I knew that what got me to that point, all the things that I'd learned, every, you know, the, the knowledge, the expertise, everything, 
if I could get myself to that point once, I can get myself there again. And I needed to continuously remind myself of that, that I can actually do that, that she may have taken away my company, my this, this amazing business that I created. She could do all of that, but she couldn't take what was in here or in, in here, you know, in, in my heart and in my spirit. And I, so it might sound, sorry, a bit airy fairy, but, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I concur with the people in the chat who are saying you are so strong. You are so inspirational. You are an absolutely phenomenal woman who is a new definition of resilience. And I know that you wouldn't refer to yourself as a hero, but I'm sure that me and everyone else who's tuned in here today is convinced that you are an absolute hero and that what you have done for women is absolutely phenomenal. And just wow, I'm completely blown away. And so people would like to find out how can they get involved in the work that um, you, you I, I'm not sure if you still do it, or that you did while you were back in India. Yeah, so the human rights work was in um, India. And, and what I continued when I came to South Africa was the, the social change theme, you know, so that ability to still um, give value. My purpose is about ensuring that as many humans as I can reach are able to enjoy full access to their human rights. And, and I believe in um, that, that, you know, it, it sounds so just with everything happening in the country, I, I feel it, it may sound or come out wrong, but I truly believe in the equality of human beings. I don't understand how your circumstance, your, uh, what opportunity you've gotten, what color of your skin or, um, or the, you know, whatever, however your hair is. I don't understand how, how this creates anything that is different in a human being. The only difference is what, what is in your heart. That's the only difference is, do you actually add value into the world or not? So my purpose is around, is around helping people access that value. I've chosen to now narrow it down to um, enabling people to um, have economic access. And the way that I believe that can be done is through an entrepreneurial lens because the jobs are not coming. And, and people need to be able to, to create livelihoods for themselves and their, their families and to be able to you know, build productive and fulfilling lives um, through access to the economy. So that's what I've now chosen to narrow in on. So the work that I do now is primarily focused on the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation. That's the, that's the day job. I have like these, um, these side hustles um, in that something that I'm deeply concerned about is about sexual violence against children and the fact that more than 80% of it is committed by someone known to the family or to the child, that, that is horrifying for me. And so my brain is busy working on what kind of solution, uh, not solution maybe because that's, that's too, uh, maybe too sort of ambitious, but what is a way that we can create awareness and create the this, this sense of, you know, if you see something wrong, say something. Um, and, and so that's one thing that I'm working on. I'd love, um, you know, people to help me brainstorm that and figure out what we could do together. And, and the other thing is that I'm deeply concerned about um, access to medication for people in townships and rural areas. It worries me that uh, people cannot access, you know, even sometimes common medications, but that they have to struggle so much that even in public hospitals, they'll stand in long queues and then they get to the front and, and, and that medication is out of stock. So, so my, my, my best friend, Tanasha and I are working on uh, creating a social enterprise that, that um, actually um, uh, addresses that. So again, would love some, some support and, and you know, uh, ideas or whatever value anyone would like to bring to that. To the foundation, yeah, I mean, if anyone wants to, um, to mentor, to walk alongside any of our young um, 
you know, entrepreneurial young people, I'm, I'm happy for that as well. I absolutely love your problem solving mentality. And it's, it's one of the things that you mentioned, which is take action in that you see an issue that worries you, you see a problem in the community and you immediately take action. There's a lot of us who see it and we think there's nothing we can do about it. So we hope, mm. we hope that someone else will do something about it. So I, I think if there's mm. anything we learn today, it's that we all need to take action. There's more of us than there are of them. And if we yes. could just work together, we really could achieve some amazing things. Um, and so coming back to the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation and back to the topic of leadership, how do you think young leaders, or, or what do you think rather, young leaders need to do in order to be taken seriously? So there's a lot of young leaders who are now um, stepping into the leadership platforms, really trying to get their voices yeah. heard, trying to make a name for themselves. But it always comes back to this ageism thing of you're young, <laughs> you don't have the experience, you need to yeah. wait um, and hopefully when you're old enough, you know, we'll take you serious. Yeah, 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 that's a pity. Uh, I mean, obviously both the young and the old or the, the older have uh, value to bring in different, in different ways. So I think that's uh, like ludicrous, but I will remind everyone about this thing that I, I mentioned um, it's not my original thought, but but I because I love it so much, it it kind of I tend to integrate it into what I talk about. Is are you improving on the silence? So yes, we want our voices heard, but I think the first question everyone should be asking themselves is how am I improving on the silence? Am I just adding my um, hat in the ring? Am I just like sort of putting up my hand and wanting to almost? Uh, be a like also ran in the race, you know, and I find unfortunately um, you, you may disagree with me on this, but I find like Twitter is full of those people who um, and I'm not just talking about the latest little Twitter um, sort of debacle, but 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 just like that everyone's an armchair activist. Everyone is is got some argument. Everyone thinks they have a monopoly on the truth. Everyone wants to jump into this whole fray and say something and say it with that almost like absolute conviction that only they are right, that there's no other perspective. So I used to be on, on Twitter and I actually <laughs> left it because of that. Now the only kind of social media I'm really on is, is LinkedIn. But um, so, so I think for me, the, the key bit of advice is to is to not just, um, how do I put this? I think it's important to raise your voice to something, but don't just come at it like you're coming, you know, you're coming to, to a, a sort of a, a small Sunday family argument with all your artillery. You just like every, you know, everything, you've got all your army tankers and your weapons and everything, and you're coming full blast at it. And I think maybe that, is where um, that, that ageism, some of it um, comes in, where people feel like, you know, I mean, we've had some discussions around, around this at, um, uh, you know, some of my friends and I, is how to include young people more in conversations. But, but what we found is when we do, they're only coming with like bashing everything, but no solution, no proposed recommendations. Nothing that says, I truly want to meet you uh, in this topic and, and create something that's better for all of us, you know? And, and I, I feel if, if there's anything that I can give advice on, on this particular, like to answer this particular question, is, is go into it with a solution-oriented mindset. And even if you don't have the solution, be willing to listen and to, to collaborate and to co-create a solution. And, and that's, that has been the difficulty with us where, where we've had certain conversations where we've included young people uh, on the gender-based violence type conversations. And, and I found that um, uh, it's, it's very, um, it's very um, as I said, combative and, and not solutions oriented. And then not only that, it's, there's this thing of almost nobody else knows, nobody else understands, yeah. nobody else 
has thought about this or cares. So I think if you go into it with that humility and with a solutions oriented mindset and, and being, uh, you know, sort of obsessed with learning and with creating something better and adding value, then I think, um, you know, people, people should be accepting that contribution. Um, yeah. I have to agree with you 100%. I myself had to um, delete Twitter because I felt there were just a lot of conversations of trying yeah. to prove why I'm right and you're wrong yeah, and a exactly. lot less action. And so it is definitely yeah. something that and we no can work listening. on. And yeah, exactly. They're, they're not no one wants to listen. Either, right? yeah, it's, yeah. it's no one's listening and no one actually wants to listen. No one wants yeah. to be told they're wrong. So it's, it's just two people who are, are, are screaming out their opinions. Um, I'm going to see if we can quickly get this last question in, but yeah. they, someone would like to find out if you have any advice for people who would like to pursue a career in human rights. Yeah, sure. I mean, like amazing life-changing kind of decision and you could, you could like put your toes in it in different ways and, 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 and find what like resonates with you. There are any number of organizations working in this space. And I think if you do your research and if you understand what within you connects with a specific area, because like when I went to India, as I said, in my, um, you know, sort of the arrogance of youth is that I went thinking I was going to solve everything and I didn't have direction. And so I kind of tried to do, Initially, I was just like um, spinning on different things. I was, everything from like, <clears throat> so this was, this was 20 years ago. So uh, maybe climate change wasn't spoken about as much, but um, I was interested in the environment. I was interested in, you know, sort of uh, gender issues. I was interested in in, in disabilities and doing something in different areas. So I think it's important to first figure out what is it that you are interested in within this whole human rights spectrum? And where do you have value to add? So what is the value that you're, <coughs> sorry, um, what is the value that you think you can add? Do you have a, a specific skill maybe or do you want to advocate and, and lobby you know on, on policy change or do you want um, to work directly with um, beneficiaries of an organization etc so to find all of that out you may need to contact different organizations I mean um, as I said depending on what you're interested in if you look at gender-based issues you know the um, the um, what, what is it called, 16 days, 16 days of activism or whatever, I think it's around October, November. There's a lot of organizations that put out stuff. So you can do your research and you can um, find different organizations that, that are working in spaces you're interested in, have a conversation with them, look at where they need help, and then start volunteering on different projects and, and find the place where your passion and expertise needs what they need and, and, you know, creates that. Because when times get rough in working with this kind of, um, uh, in, in this kind of work, like when you're, you're doing this, when times get rough and when you really need to draw on your resilience, you need to have really connected with that cause that you're working on. You know, you can't be trying to save the vultures and then as soon as it gets hard, you're like, oh, well, you know, I actually don't care about vultures that much. There's much, you know, sort of more or other things um, that have been happening in the world. So you really need to connect deeply with what you want to, um, with the space that you want to work with. Um, if you don't come right in terms of researching with it, please reach out to me as well. I'm, I'm always happy to, to help in any way. Thank you so, so much, um, Yoga Veli. <coughs> and like Nkateko was saying, the way the session has linked up so nicely with the previous two days where on day one, we spoke about the importance of service. Day two, we spoke about implementing businesses and now learning about how important it is to have impact and to take action and to ensure that we are doing something to spread knowledge. And so oh. I, I'm really, really, I've, I've learned so much from this and I'm sure that everyone has as well.
So thank you so, so much thank for so um, much. inspiring I'm us showing, tonight. Yeah, I'm showing you my other therapy. Um, so this is Bella. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bella. So, Such a cutie. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for the invite. I really appreciate it and nice chatting to you all. Awesome. So before we log off, everyone, we're just going to do a, a quick video about service. It's just a one minute long video of the um, Do More Foundation and how we're going to be involved as Golden Key. Okay, I've been informed that the video is not available, but that's not a problem. We will be able to watch that video tomorrow. And speaking of tomorrow, we have another exciting speaker lined up. So make sure that you are there. And if you have missed any of the sessions that we previously had, make sure to go to the Golden Key South Africa YouTube channel. And if you would like to get involved in Golden Key Alumni Society things, make sure to follow at Golden Key underscore alumni on Instagram. Again, thank you everyone for being here today. I will be sure to see you tomorrow. Thank you so much to our guest speaker. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheers.